So thank you so much for coming to our webinar today. It is with the absolutely wonderful uh, Associate Professor Andrea Trico. It is on how to conduct and report your scoping review and the latest guidance on how to do so. Just a few bits of housekeeping before I hand you over to Andrea. Uh, firstly, thank you so much for coming. We will be recording this, YouTube, uh, this webinar and it will be up on our JBI Education YouTube hopefully within a week. All participants have joined in as listen only. However, you are able to interact in the chat and I'm seeing lots of you doing that right now, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, you can also ask questions via our Q&A functionality and we will be uh, responding to some of those Q&As after Andrea has finished. Um, and if you do have any feedback, please don't hesitate to contact JBI Education at adelaide.edu.au. We would also like to do an acknowledgement of country. We have uh, a global attendance here today, uh, which is fantastic. But we are going to do our acknowledgement of country from the land that Adelaide JBI is situated in. And we acknowledge that we are meeting on the traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pay respect to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land. We acknowledge that they are of continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. We also extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations. And if you would like to tweet about this webinar throughout, um, be, uh, if you are able to hashtag JBI scoping, uh, so we can track everyone's um, uh, comments on scoping reviews, and we could also interact after to be able to, if you have any questions through Twitter, and it's just a great community and collaboration if we could do that. Uh, you can also, uh, uh, include the JBI, uh, Dr. Andrea Trucos and myself, um, and we'll be happy to respond to your tweets. It is with absolute great pleasure today that I introduce Associate Professor Andrea Trico. Thank you so much for coming um, and offering your absolute expertise in this area. Uh, she is an expert methodologist in all forms of knowledge synthesis with over 200 peer-reviewed publications in the area. She currently chairs the JBI Scope and Review Methodology Group and has produced numerous published guidance on their conduction and reporting. She was a leading researcher in the development of the well-renowned PRISMA extension for Scope and Reviews. Associate Professor Trico is a scientist and Director of Knowledge, Trans, uh, Knowledge Synthesis Team in the Knowledge Translation Program in the Lee, Ke, Lee Cha Sing uh, Knowledge Institute of St. Michael's Hospital. She is also an Associate Professor at the University of Toronto in the Dalalana School of Public Health and Institute of Health Policy, uh, Management and Evaluation. She is also the Co-Director and Adjunct Associate Professor for the Queen's Collaboration for Healthcare Quality for the Joanna Briggs Institute um, at Queen's University. And I am so grateful that she's offered her time for us. And uh, Andrea, I'm going to stop sharing my screen uh, for you to be able to start your presentation. Great. Thank you so, so much, Danielle. It's such a pleasure to be here today. Um, so I will start sharing my screen. Great. Here we go. Does that look okay? Perfect. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for coming today. Um, today, I'll be discussing a topic that is incredibly close to my heart, um, thinking about scoping reviews uh, based on the latest guidance. Um, so I've personally experienced the power of scoping reviews and their usefulness for decision making. Um, and I've been working methodologically within scoping reviews for the last um, I would say seven, eight years now, um, as well as conducting multiple scoping reviews uh, for decision makers. 
So very pleased to be here today and thank you so much to Danielle and Zachary Munn and everyone from JBI for inviting me here today. So I'd like to begin with an acknowledgement of the traditional land on which my research team operates in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. For thousands of years, it was the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. This land is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are incredibly grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. I have no conflicts of interest to declare. Um, I will declare that scoping reviews is a topic that I'm incredibly passionate about. And as Danielle mentioned, I am the chair of the scoping review methodology group for the JBI. So today I'm gonna define and describe what a scoping review is and describe some of the steps of doing a scoping review. I'm also gonna talk about the latest guidance. So JBI, Scoping Methodology Group, we recently published the updated scoping review chapter in the JBI handbook. Um, so if you haven't had an opportunity to, to read that, I would highly encourage you to check that out. So I will be discussing the latest guidance, so the JBI 2020 scoping review guide. And then I'm also going to talk a little bit about the preferred reporting items for systematic reviews and meta-analysis extension for scoping reviews or the Prisma SCR checklist. So I think we're going to pause here quickly just to get a little bit of a flavor of what everyone in the audience's experiences with scoping reviews. So please answer, would you consider yourself an expert in scoping reviews? Uh, have you conducted scoping reviews? Do you have limited experience with scoping reviews or are you new to scoping reviews? So I think we'll pause right now, uh, Danielle, for that poll. Uh, yes, I do apologise. That poll isn't actually available, uh, but we are seeing a lot of people in the chat um, say that it's D. So I am new to scope and reviews. We've got a few people that are saying they've conducted a scope and review previously, um, but looks like we've got mostly new people um, or limited experience. Okay, excellent. Great. Well, thank you so much uh, for putting that into the chat. So that's incredibly helpful. So um, uh, not to worry, we will be talking a lot about um, how to do a scoping review for beginners. Um, and hopefully those who have a bit more experience with scoping reviews will learn something from my presentation today as well. So I'm going to move on to discuss what is a scoping review. Um, so this is a tool that my team developed. Um, so it's basically helping you determine which knowledge synthesis method is the most appropriate for your research question. Um, so right now we focus on 10 quantitative knowledge synthesis methods and scoping reviews is one of these. Um, and also want to highlight that the qualitative arm of the tool is forthcoming. So if you're not sure whether your project is a systematic review or a scoping review or a rapid review or, or an overview of reviews, etc., this tool is very helpful. You just answer a series of five to six questions and then it will tell you at the end which um, type of knowledge synthesis is likely the most helpful to answer your question. So the definition of a scoping review that we like to use is the one put forth by, by our Canadian Institutes of Health Research. So this is our national funding body in Canada and we call it CIHR for short. Their definition is that scoping reviews are exploratory projects that systematically map the literature available on a topic, identifying key concepts, theories, sources of evidence and gaps in the research. And there are many different terms used to describe scoping reviews. So um, one of the most common one uh, terminology is a scoping review, but the second most common terminology is a scoping study. Um, and then sometimes they're called systematic scoping review. So in the latest JBI 2020 guide, we have recommend using, recommended using the terminology scoping review uh, because the purpose of it is to synthesize information. So that's why we have um, not recommended using the terminology scoping study. And actually in epidemiology, a scoping study is, is actually something else that's not a scoping review as we think of a scoping review. 
Um, and again, we don't use the terminology systematic scoping review because we would hope that all types of knowledge synthesis are systematic. Um, and we also don't want to create confusion with a systematic review. Um, so the most common term is a scoping review and this is, this is a terminology that we recommend when you are doing your scoping review. So this is a very incredibly useful paper that was published by Zachary Munn and colleagues and they noted in their paper why scoping reviews are useful. So they are useful as a precursor to a systematic review. So sometimes we just want to know a snapshot of the literature that's been conducted out there on a topic and then later on we're going to use this to inform the conduct of a more concise and a more, um, when, we're, when we're thinking about a systematic review, the research question is generally more focused than the scoping review. So the scoping review is a lot broader. So we would do this broad review and then this would help identify areas for a more focused systematic review. Um, it could also help us to identify different types of available evidence on a topic or analyze different knowledge gaps, clarify key concepts or definitions, examine how research has been conducted on a topic, as well as key characteristics or factors related to a particular concept or topic. So the initial scoping review framework was proposed by Arxion O'Malley in 2005, and this was about elaborated by Lavac, Cahoon, and O'Brien in 2010. The JBI published their original guidance in 2015 this has been updated in 2017 and then again most recently in 2020. So today I'm going to be focused on the 2020 update. Um, as well, I want to note that the Prisma SCR was published in 2018 and again this is the reporting guideline specific for your scoping review. So I'm not sure, Danielle, if we're doing the poll, but maybe if it's not working we can just ask people in the chat. Um, does that make sense? Uh, yeah, no, we actually have the poll here. So I can okay, launch perfect. that poll for you. Um, if I could just get everyone to uh, quickly say what, what scoping review guidance are you most familiar with? We're getting quite a lot of responses right now. I'll just give it maybe 10 more seconds for everyone to put their responses in. I'm going to end the polling and what I can do is I'm going to share the results. Andrew, are you able to see those results? I am, yes. Thank you so much. So it seems like most people are familiar with JBI guidance, <laughs> which is great to see. Um, and then the second ranked one was the Arxiom and O'Malley and then the third was the Levac. Um, so thank you so much everyone for, for voting on that. Um, great to see that people were aware of the JBI guidance. Um, and if people have not had a chance to read the seminal Arxian O'Malley paper, I would definitely encourage you to do that, as well as the paper conducted by Levac La et um, to get some further insight on that. So that's fantastic. Thank you, Danielle, and thanks everyone for voting on that. So I'm gonna move on to the steps of doing a scoping review. Um, so these are the high level steps that we would think about when we are doing a systematic review. And I wanna make some key differentiating factors here between a systematic review and a scoping review with this, these steps. So first we would start with a protocol. And when we're thinking about a scoping review, as I mentioned previously, you're gonna have a much broader research question than a more focused systematic review. <clears throat> Excuse me. Often with a systematic review, we limit to the PICO framework or we use the PICO or PCOST framework uh, when we are deciding on our research questions. So this would stand for the population, interventions, comparators, outcomes, study designs, and timeframe. Oftentimes when we're doing a scoping review, we think more about the PCC. And this is what we talk about in the JBI 2020 guide. So this is focused on the population, the concept, and the context. Um, we are unable to register so scoping reviews with Prospero, so we often use the open science framework for registering our scoping reviews. And you can also register your title with the JBI if that is something that you're considering pursuing publishing your scoping review with the JBI journal. 
and that's the JBI Evidence Synthesis Journal. Then we would move on to our literature search. So um, regardless of whether it's a systematic review or a scoping review, we always recommend searching more two or more databases. Um, and we also want to consider searching for difficult to locate or unpublished literature. And sometimes we refer to this as gray literature. We may also scan the references of included studies or relevant reviews that we identify on the topic. When we're thinking about a scoping review, because the question is quite broad, um, oftentimes we're focused on different types of information, so commentaries, opinion pieces, blogs, websites. So this would be a little different than a systematic review where the unit of analysis is most likely a study. So for a scoping review, the unit could be quite much broader than that. And we also would recommend that a second librarian peer review the electronic search strategy using the press checklist. When we move on to the study selection, we often want to start with a pilot test. So where everyone in the team, they uh, use the predefined eligibility criteria to screen a sample all together. And then what we would do is when we have high agreement, then two people would independently screen all the titles and abstracts and disagreements would be resolved through discussion or through the involvement of a third individual. So when we're thinking about a scoping review, we often call data abstraction charting instead of um, data abstraction, because what we're trying to do is come up with a high level summary or details of the population concept and context as per the literature. Um, so we're, we're following a similar process to data abstraction, but we might be charting different things. So we might be charting the evidence according to where they were conducted, according to the different studies that were involved. We might come up with, um, uh, we may not focus, uh, for example, on the results per se. It all depends on the objectives of your scoping review and what you're att attempting to get out of it. Um, so we would use a similar process in that we would have a predefined standardized charting form and we would pilot test amongst the team. And when everyone is comfortable with this, then two people would chart the evidence and then we would have um, disagreements resolved through discussion or, or with a third person. So one thing that we don't recommend with a scoping review is the risk of bias appraisal. So actually this, this is considered an optional step when we published a scoping review of 494 scoping reviews in the past, we found that very few of them actually conducted any methodological quality or risk of bias appraisal. And the reason for this is because the purpose of a scoping review is not to come up with a meta-analysis or an answer based on a synthesized result. So we're more like, it's a more exploratory study. We're not testing any hypotheses here. And we're just asking what has ever been done before on this topic in the literature? Um, sometimes when we work with decision makers or individuals who commission the scoping review, they may request the methodological quality or risk of bias appraisal. Um, it is up to you if you would like to do that, if it makes sense according to your research question. However, you know, oftentimes what we do is we start with the broad scan of the literature through the scoping review. Then we identify areas where we would do more focused systematic reviews, and then that's when we would uh, conduct the risk of bias appraisal at that point in time. For data synthesis, um, no meta-analysis is done. So information is, is described, just it's very descriptive. You might talk about common themes or common things that you see in the literature, but there's no formal qualitative evidence synthesis here. And we're really focusing on charting the evidence and identifying data gaps. And the goal is not to come up with policy or practice recommendations. So we're really trying to think about what are the gaps in the literature? Where has the literature been conducted? It could help inform a research program. So where do we need, need some uh, primary studies? Where do we need, need systematic reviews? And then really when you're doing the systematic review or the most more focused uh, systematic review that follows the scoping review, that's when you can start thinking about policy or practice recommendations. Um, so the purpose of the scoping review is very high level and that's why we have to tailor our methods according to the objectives of what we're trying to achieve with a scoping review. So now I'm gonna switch gears to talk a little bit about um, the guidance for scoping reviews. And I'm gonna start a little with the protocol. 
So if you were to do a JBI protocol for a scoping review, these are some of the elements that you would need to think about. Before I get into that, um, I'm going to tell you the differences between the JBI 2017 guide and the 2020 guide that we just released a couple months ago. So this version was updated with changes that correspond to the latest methodological developments, and this was determined by the JBI methodology group and JBI scientific committees. Um, so the Prisma SCR, as I mentioned, was published in 2018, so we wanted to ensure that the 2020 guide incorporated all of those changes that we discussed in the Prisma SCR. Also, scoping reviews can now be registered, so this was something that we wanted to note in JBI 2020. And we provide more emphasis and more examples on presentation of results in JBI 2020. We also provide more guidance on what a scoping review can do and can't do. So again, we're not trying to get to policy or practice recommendations with the scoping review, and we've tried to clarify that in the JBI 2020 guide. So whenever you begin a scoping review, you always need to start with a protocol. So this really is your map of the entire project. And you can register it on the Open Science Framework or FigShare. So Open Science Framework would be something that I'm more commonly familiar with. Um, however, there are there is the other FigShare that you could use as well. Uh, your protocol will provide a plan and it will also help limit any potential for reporting bias later on in your review. And any deviations in your method should be highlighted and explained in the final scoping review that you write up. So you really want to develop a protocol and you want to make sure that you follow this throughout. Although we understand that some iterations and some changes may happen along the way, that's totally okay. But we want to just make sure that you um, keep track of any of those deviations that may happen. You want to make sure that the title is informative and clear and you always include a scoping review. Uh, so again, this is the terminology that we've uh, decided upon with the JBI 2020 guide. And it is the most common terminology used in the literature. Um, also want to note that by calling it a scoping review, it makes it easier for people to identify it when they're doing literature searches. And it also is useful to, to make sure that that we see that you're actually using the JBI 2020 guide as well as the Prisma SCR when you identify your project as being a scoping review. Um, we don't recommend that the title is phrased as a question and we wanna make sure that your title uh, has the structure to represent the PCC. So again, this is very useful for helping people when they're conducting literature searches to identify your scoping review. So your research question will also help guide and direct the development of the specific inclusion criteria. And it will facilitate the effectiveness in the literature search. So again, you probably want to include at least the three components of the PCC in your research question as well as is in your literature search. And you may have some sub questions that will outline how the evidence is likely to be mapped. So you might have some hunches on that beforehand. You may have done some scoping searches. Um, so some preliminary literature searches is what I mean by that, um, to, to kind of understand the literature. And this may lead to some sub-questions that are really important to you, and you may wish to outline these uh, in your protocol. Your introduction should be comprehensive and cover all the main elements of the topic under review. And you also want to state clearly the reason for undertaking the scoping review, as well as what does the scoping review intend to inform. So this will really help shape the methods and tailor the methods according to exactly what you're trying to do, right? So oftentimes when you're thinking about a scoping review, they're very broad and they're questions like what has been done in the literature on this topic in the past, um, you know, or, or um, how can we conceptualize the concept of this based on the literature? So very, very broad questions. And it's important to think about what is your aim before you get started. And any important definition should be clearly delineated. So we wanna also put the inclusion criteria in context and state if there are any pre-existing scoping reviews. And then you wanna conclude with an overarching review objective. 
So for the inclusion criteria, you want to think about what are the important patient or participant characteristics. So one important element would be the age. So the concept would be which interventions, phenomena of interest, outcomes, format, or contents of the included study. So these are all different types of examples of the core concept to be examined. And the context will vary depending on the objective and question of the review. So you want to consider cultural factors, maybe you're limiting the context to a particular country or health system or part of the healthcare system. So maybe thinking about a clinic, for example, or uh, inpatients within a hospital as an example. So you want to think carefully about this. And again, it all comes down to what is the aim of your review and um, how can you uh, come up with evidence that's most useful for that aim. So which type of information will you be included? So this could be things like, oh, I'm interested in studies or, oh, I'm interested in, um, you know, we did a scoping review of uh, looking at social media. So we were looking at things like websites and blogs and, and um, that type of thing. So, so again, the types of evidence will really depend on your scoping review and what objective that you have. So your search strategy should be as comprehensive as possible and any limitations that you use. And when I say limitations, I'm thinking about things such as language. So perhaps, you know, you may be limiting it by language of publication. Um, perhaps you're limiting it by the last uh, 10 years. As an example, um, this all needs to be detailed and justified. Um, and just want to note that we do recommend searching all languages whenever you can and trying to, to include all years whenever you can. Let's say it's an intervention that came out, you know, in 2008, then maybe you want to limit from 2008 onwards. Um, I usually say that, well, if it was became available in 2008, there's probably not a lot of citations before then anyways for you to screen out. Um, but just to be thoughtful about your literature search, and, and if you do decide to use limitations, please detail these and justify why you had to do that. And the JBI recommends a three-step search strategy. So you do an initial limited search. So this is where you have at least two online databases. Then you search using all the identified keywords. And then this is when you're doing it in all included databases. And then you also do some reference list searching um, and perhaps more gray literature searching, et cetera, et cetera. So in this type of way, you kind of refine things as you go along and you also identify more and more literature. It's kind of like a snowball. Um, so this would be the, the strategy that is recommended and um, you will have to clearly delineate this in your protocol. So again, um, you may need to uh, include gray literature searching. So that's something to be cognizant of. And if you intend to contact authors, then you need to mention this. Um, we also recommend that one database is peer reviewed using the press checklist. And as I mentioned, we recommend no restrictions on source of inclusion by language unless there's really clear reasons justified. Um, and we wanna have one search strategy for all the sources and we want to make sure that we are being transparent when we develop our search. So we will also then decide um, or discuss whether we used any software when we were doing our screening. And then also we recommend two or more reviewers independently. Um, however, if you were only able to have one reviewer and one verifier, all of this needs to be clearly described in your protocol. And any disagreements, um, you need to, to discuss how will these be resolved. So will they be resolved through discussion? Will you have to involve a third person? Will it depend? Um, so these are all things that you need to think about upfront. The draft turning form can be developed and piloted at the protocol stage to record key information of the source. So this will aid in you becoming familiar with the results. And they also recommend that at least two people pilot the form. So depending on the project and the team, like usually my entire team would pilot the form. And then we would create changes to the form and work together, make sure we have definitions, everyone agrees on everything. Um, and this can be further refined at the review stage and, uh, and uh, might be updated later on. So there is a template that the JBI provides. So this is incredibly helpful. So this is something that when you're thinking about data charting for you to, to consider and for you to use, it's a very helpful resource for helping you with uh, your charting form. 
So when you're thinking through of your analysis, you don't want to synthesize the outcome um, and the co qualitative content analysis is very descriptive. You should not undertake any formal thematic analysis. That is totally beyond the scope of a scoping review. Um, so it's basically a very high level. Um, as a non-qualitative person, when I hear thematic analysis, I think you're just kind of lumping in categories and doing themes. So that's not <laughs> what we're talking about here. So you can absolutely talk about like putting some categories together. It's very descriptive in nature. We're not, you know, coming up with coding and revising the coding iteratively here. We're not having two people code things. Like it's just a very high level. Like these things are kind of categorized together and just very high level. No matter what you do, you want to be transparent and explicit and you want to justify your approach. So again, when we're analyzing this, we're not recommending any formal qualitative or quantitative analysis. So no formal thematic analysis, nor for, no formal meta-analysis at this point. So when we present the results, we will often think about a draft chart, figure or table, and we may wish to uh, provide charts and tables. So maybe thinking about, uh, we may sort this by the year of publication, the country of origin, the type of intervention or the methods used. So these are some ideas on, of how you can present the results. You may want to draw different figures um, or a map. So that would be helpful if you're thinking of something like con countries of origin. And we do provide some uh, examples and ways to present the evidence um, for a scoping review. So then just to highlight some differences when we're moving from a protocol uh, to the um, full scoping review. So you have to have the affiliations for authors and if they have a JBI affiliation, include that. Um, you also have to include the email contact details and if there are any conflicts of interest and in particular for the corresponding author. So your abstract will have to accurately reflect the review with a focus on the results. So you would have your overall arching objective. The introduction would be what the issue is and what is already known and then your inclusion criteria. So just in a few sentences and without including any subheadings. Your methods would include the key information sources, limits on the scope of search, source selection, data abstraction or data charting and presentation of data. And then you may include the, the type in, of included sources and participants, the main findings, uh, as well as the overall conclusions very briefly, and then the directly the responding to the objective and implication. So this is a high level summary of what you need to, to think about and what you need to report for your abstract. So when you're thinking about the data charting for the full review at the end, so you want to think about author year, the objectives, and then again, the PCC. So sometimes people present your results according to the PCC. You may wish to map the extracted data. So this could be a diagram, table, descriptive format. And you have to provide clear explanations for the categories. So this is how I was talking about how you may start lumping together things in categories. So what were the interventions type? If it was an intervention scoping review, what was the population? How, what was the duration of intervention? So how long did people receive the intervention? What were the aims? Was the methodology adopted or was it followed closely? What were the key findings? And again, a scoping review is incredibly helpful for identifying gaps. So for your search, you have to identify how many sources were identified and selected, and you have a very high level description of the process. So we recommend that you use the Prisma flowchart. So this is the overall flowchart diagram um, that was uh, published by David Moore and colleagues. And, and this is helpful for a scoping review as well. It was originally developed for systematic reviews, um, but this flowchart is the standard, uh, start, standard one that we use in any type of evidence synthesis. And it just allows us to keep track of how many citations flowed in, how many full text did you screen, and show some of the decisions that you made along the way to include or exclude uh, sources of evidence. So you will include an overall description of the included sources of evidence and you will have a summary table with all the appendices. So you wanna include all that data that you charted. You wanna create these nice tables that you, they could be quite long depending on how many um, types of evidence sources that you've included. So 
Um, you often include these in the appendix, um, but you also want to have some nice summary tables presented as well. And you will provide some detail to support the inclusion of each source. So showing you know, what the details were, in particular, at least the PCC for each source um, of evidence that you included in your scoping review. So moving on to the discussion, you have to discuss the results and limitations. Um, so we're, we're not trying to repeat the results here. So again, thinking about how do we interpret this information um, how can we discuss these results, uh, putting them into context with current literature, gaps of the literature, and again, you know, because we didn't appraise risk of bias or methodological quality, you know, we're not really expecting any rating of quality of evidence to be provided here. It's just more a high level. This is what was found in the evidence and kind of leaving it at that. So when you're getting to your conclusions, you have to, again, match back to your review objective and question. So, a subsection is recommended to in include the implications for future research, and this will be based on the gaps on the knowledge identified from the results of the review. And again, scoping reviews do not include implications for practice, so this section could be omitted. So there could be high-level results that could be used to potentially inform practice uh, based on the gaps of the literature, but we're not focused on coming up with any recommendations to change practice or policy because that would not be the intention of your scoping review. So I'm just going to spend a few minutes because I want to make sure we have some question uh, time for questions at the end, just to talk about the Prisma SCR. So um, the original Prisma statement, uh, we actually had to delete seven items. Um, from the 27 original PRISMA items when we focus on the PRISMA SCR. So we had to exclude seven because um, we just found that, um, sorry, we had to exclude five because they didn't, they just were not relevant and they didn't fit with a scoping review. So remember the PRISMA statement was developed for systematic reviews. Um, we ne now needed to think about it very carefully for scoping reviews and see which items were relevant or not relevant. And then also want to say that we did modify all of the items to make sure that they made sense when it came to a scoping review. So these were the five items excluded. So for example, the summary measures, the risk of bias, additional analyses, all of these items, as I mentioned already in my little nice little diagram when we're talking about the methods of a scoping review, these were deemed not applicable for scoping reviews, so they were excluded. I just want to note um, that if you follow this link, then you are going to find some very useful tools for the Prisma SCR. So there's a little one page brief on the Prisma SCR, how was it conducted, um, what a high level summary of what we found. And we also have a tip sheet for each of the 22 items. So definitely recommend you checking that out. So for each item, we have a little summary of what the item means, what we're intending to get to when, we're, when it comes to reporting our, your scoping review. And we also provide an example of a good reporting uh, for that particular item. So definitely encourage you to check that out. So this is the, the web link provided here. And then we also created a really cute short YouTube video it's about two or three minutes, um, just talking about the Prisma SCR, how it was developed and what does it cover. So for those of you who are not familiar, I would encourage you to read our paper. So that was published in the Annals of Internal Medicine in, in 2018. Um, and we encourage you to check out these resources um, that are on our website. So in terms of some uh, future work, so Prisma 2020, so the Prisma statement, for those of you who don't know, it will be published by the end of this year. That's being led by Matthew Page, who's actually in Australia as well. Um, so that uh, hopefully we'll be seeing that out. And it is quite different than the, um, the previous version of the Prisma statement. Um, so again, we'll highly encourage everyone to check that out when that comes out. And one of the recommendations in Prisma 2020 is that all of the extensions should be updated uh, just so that they are most current with the Prisma statement. So we are planning to update the Prisma SCR later on. Um, we also are planning to develop a risk of bias tool for scoping reviews. 
Um, and also I published this paper, a scoping review on the conduct and reporting of scoping reviews. This was published in 2016, but I believe the literature search went only to 2015. And we know that there's been so many scoping reviews that have been published since then. Um, so we do want to update uh, the scoping review on the conduct and reporting of scoping reviews. And just want to note that all this future work will be led uh, by members of the JBI scoping review methodology group. So just quickly, I think I have two minutes uh, for a couple of acknowledgements. So just want to acknowledge my amazing team. Uh, in particular, want to give a huge shout, shout out to Nav.man who helped so much with this, as well as Patricia Rios who helped me put all these slides together. So thank you to everyone. It's such an amazing, fabulous team that I have the privilege and honor of working with every day. I also want to thank my colleagues from the JBI Scoping Review Methodology Group, and in particular to Danielle and Zach uh, for all of their support with this webinar. And it's a real pleasure working with everyone here. I learn from all of you. We have monthly calls. It's always a lot of fun. Um, and just um, I'm incredibly grateful for your collegiality and collaboration and looking forward to the exciting projects that we have planned ahead. Also want to acknowledge all the contributors to the Prisma SCR. So there is a lot of us. Um, again, a really fantastic team and thanks everyone and, and looking forward to updating that with you in, in the next couple years. Um, and I have a couple references that um, I think that we'll be able to share. If anyone has any questions about anything I presented today, uh, please let me know. And I think I will end with that. So thank you so, so much. Um, thank you so much, Andrea, for that. I really appreciate um, that, that discussion about how to conduct um, a scoping review. I might just kick you off your share screen. I do apologize. And yeah, share no worries. Screen. No, no, it's okay. I can do it. Do yeah. it. Um, and we can go into the Q&As because we've got quite a, I think, a, a lively uh, discussion on some of the questions here. Um, what we're asking here is, you made a good contrast with systematic reviews, but what about scoping reviews versus mapping reviews? Clearly yeah. mapping is part of the overall scoping review process, but surely scoping implies setting boundaries for inclusion or exclusion. How would you define the difference between the mapping review and a scoping review? Yeah, so that's super helpful and, and that's a very important question. So I think that um, they are definitely related. Um, and in our PRISMA SCR, we did note that um, it would be applicable to scoping reviews as well as to mapping reviews. Um, so oftentimes when we're thinking about a mapping review, you know, we are focused on presenting a map and, and putting all the evidence out there geographically, which may not necessarily be the purpose of a scoping review. Um, so I definitely think there is some overlap and um, some commonalities there. And um, to my in my opinion, I, I wouldn't see how the JBI guidance or the PRISMA scoping review wouldn't be relevant to a, a mapping review. Um, the next question that we have, I'm trying to get through all of them. Uh, you mentioned <laughs> a librarian should check the search via some kind of checklist. Is there a specific checklist you were referring to? I assume that yes. is Oh, sorry. Yes, I cut you off there, Danielle, because I was so excited. Um, so this is the, the press checklist. So this was published by Dr. Jesse McGowan. It's in the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology. If you can't find the citation, let me know. But if you type in McGowan and press and Journal of Clinical Epidemiology, you should be able to find it. So that would be the checklist that we, we would recommend to use. Uh, the other question that we had, and I thought that this was really timely, as I know JBI are definitely trying to discuss this, if it's open to any language, how do we actually read every, include every language in our scoping review? Yeah, so I think that that's challenging, and I think the JBI Scientific Committee is, uh, Advisory Committee is working on this, so I think, you know, um, there are tools, so maybe starting off with Google Translate as a start, I know it's not the most accurate, um, but it could be helpful, um, and then perhaps, you know, trying to work with folks within your collaboration or within your network to help with translation, so that's something that I know JBI is considering, and hopefully, I, I believe they are planning to uh, put forth some further additional guidance on that. So I think it's a really important question in particular with resources um, and something definitely that, you know, look out for because I know JBI is, is cognizant of this and will be providing some guidance. 
is it necessary to include a grey literature when conducting a scope and review? Yeah, so I think it depends on your question, right? So if you know that there is going to be most of it is in the published literature, then perhaps it doesn't make sense to do that. But if you're looking at something like maybe some policies, so, so you know, we do a lot of stuff with policymakers as an example. Um, and so, you know, a, a lot of times the policies might not necessarily be published, right? So you have to think about the, the topic and the concept that you're looking at in your scoping review and then decide, you know, is the bulk of the information available in the published literature or do we need to supplement this with some great literature searching? So it's a great question. Again, it may depend on time and resources. I think if you do have the time and the resources and it makes sense that it should absolutely be considered. I thought this was also another interesting question. We've got, we have got some time, thankfully. Um, Yay. <laughs> often we never do, so I'm pretty happy. <laughs> Does scope and review allow going back and forth the different steps? Um, for example, when screening evidence, if I'm excluding literature on a particular topic and while doing analysis, I realise that some information on a topic might be relevant in that case, can I go back to screening process and include more evidence then? I mean, I think in, in any review, we allow for this iterative type of thing to happen. So, you know, if you learn more evidence as you go along or learn more about the topic as you go along and you realize, oh, you know, I forgot to include this concept or this intervention in my search, then, you know, I, I think it's fine to go back. The only thing would be to just be very transparent in the changes um, that you've made from your protocol. And that's why it's always good to start with the protocol and then just keep a log. So we have this kind of log, I usually use like a Word document where I'm logging all the decisions and changes that were made and the reasons why. So, you know, I think if you come up with a better review because of your learnings along the way, like no one's gonna get mad at you or you're not gonna lose any points for doing that. <laughs> um, but it's just a matter of being very transparent in that and saying, why did those changes occur? And also thinking through being very thoughtful about, did that really impact your results and how did it impact your results? So just being transparent and thoughtful of the process, I think then you'll be fine to do that. Uh, the other question that I, I feel free to refer to me is, can the speaker comment on publishing a scoping review protocol with JBI evidence synthesis? I understand that Prospera will not host the review protocol, but it's my understanding that JBI Journal will publish it. Right, so that's a great question. So you can register with the Open Science Framework or FigShare. So we do talk about that in the JBI 2020 guide. Um, and then you can publish your scoping review protocol with the JBI Evidence Synthesis Journal as well. So um, you absolutely can submit it and also know that when you submit it to the JBI Journal, there will be two peer reviewers uh, reviewing your paper. And it's great to get all that feedback at the protocol stage because that can be used to improve your scoping review methodology throughout. So um, we recommend registering it um, with either Open Science Framework or Figshare, and then also publishing it with JBI Evidence Synthesis if you, you know, are planning to um, further disseminate the, the plan for your scoping review as well as, well as get some great peer-reviewed feedback on how to improve your methods. Excellent. Uh, some one would just like a little bit more clarification between the PRISMA scoping reviews and the PRISMA flowchart. Where and how do we indicate the PRISMA scoping review in a scoping review? Yeah, so that is just how you would um, present the results or the flow of your literature search results through the scoping review. That's in the flow chart. So for the Prisma SCR, we recommended that you use the original Prisma statement flow chart. We had no revisions to it. Um, so we felt that it would be very similar to what you would do for a Prisma, um, sorry, for a scoping review. Okay. And I think probably one final question, and I, I do realize that we have missed questions. So please, as I said, tweet at us and we probably will hopefully be able to answer them between myself um, and Andrea and even uh, Zach, Zachary Munn, who's our Director of Cancer of Science. He, he's agreed to be on Twitter as well. Um, so please tweet at us and we'll be happy to offer some more insight on the questions we haven't answered. But uh, one's question is, if the scope and review does not apply to a specific population, uh, such as patients, but more generally at a healthcare system level, is there an alternative to the PCC in this instance? 
Yeah, so I mean, we try to um, use the PCC to have some, set some boundaries. <laughs> um, so if it's like a general health population, then maybe that would be your P, would be a general health population. So the P could be quite, quite broad. Um, and, you know, you may wish to use something like the SPICE, if you'd like, or some other framework for the question, if that's more helpful and more relevant to your topic. We just recommend the PCC because we have found that it has been incredibly helpful for scoping reviews, and it also is quite broad. So thinking about patients or populations, the concept and the context. Um, but knowing that, you know, your P in there could be incredibly broad, like the, a general health population of all ages, as an example. Yeah, excellent. Thank you so much, um, Andrea, for your time. Um, and as I said, for those questions that we have missed, and I do realise we missed quite a few, please tweet at us and we'll hope to be able to answer them. Uh, my handle is at P 89 Andrea, yours is at Atrico. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and or even just at the JBI um, C, we would be, we'll hopefully have access to those tweets and be able to give you a little bit more um, response as to that. So I also, uh, for the lucky few that were able to join, we actually had some technical difficulties with some people uh, being able to attend, but we again hope this has all been recorded. Uh, we have an announcement to make, actually a few announcements to make that we hope will help you in your um, scoping reviews, uh, especially for those that are very new, but we've developed the scoping review network. Now, this is something that the scoping review methodology group has felt very passionate um, uh, about, and we're very excited that this is open to anyone inter interested in scoping review from uh, you know, no one having any idea to the more experienced methodologists, you'll get access to our newsletter that we are developing, our resources that we've talked about today. Uh, we have leaked all those onto this website as well. We've developed a protocol template as well. Um, and that is you have access to that on the website and uh, peer review articles that have been developed by the scoping review methodology group. So that website is now live. Uh, it's scopingreviews.jbi.global. You can subscribe um, and join our network. Um, you can also send emails to ask our methodologist some questions. So highly recommend you have a look at scopingreviews.jbi.global. The next uh, announcement that we're also very, very proud to announce um, is that JBI have worked in conjunction with the University of Adelaide to develop an online self-paced course on undertaking a scoping review. Uh, this course off is very similar to our in-person or right now, a remote attendance scoping review course that JBI offer, um, but it's self-paced. You'll get an overview of knowledge synthesis, uh, when to perform a scoping review, and how to form an appropriate question and how to develop a scoping review protocol. And then obviously how to then present and report a scoping review. So you can um, go to that link as well. In some post email, uh, post webinar, uh, you'll get an email which will link all of this as well. So don't worry about, you, you, will, you will have access to this. Um, but this is a, a course that we've worked very hard on to be able to give you as much knowledge as we have about scoping reviews that you can then take in an online self-paced course. We hope you can join at our next webinar. Um, and it is with our Director of Transfer Science, uh, Associate Professor Zachary Munn. He'll be saying that evidence-based healthcare plays a critical role in improving outcomes and ensuring quality healthcare for all. Although the movement has found widespread approval over its 30-year history, the movement has also been faced with condemnation, critiques and challenges. 
in the next webinar, Associate Professor Zachary Munn, um, along with our host, Dr. Timothy Barker, will discuss the criticisms of evidence-based healthcare, uh, past and present, reflect on the validity of these critiques, and then provide a response. So it's surely to be a thought-provoking webinar for our next month. So thank you so much for joining. Uh, we appreciate your time. And as I said, I understand there had been some technical difficulties. I would like to assure you that we are going to put this on our JBI Educ um, YouTube with as quick as we can. Um, and we are happy to interact with you over tweeting or through email, which is the JBI education at adelaide.edu.au. Um, through our scoping review network um, page that we have just developed as well. Um, so as I said, this YouTube video will be up as soon as possible, but feel free to tweet us any questions you had or email us any questions you may have as well. Uh, for, for any further information about uh, JBI, please go to our JBI Education website uh, and to our YouTube channel. Thank you so much for joining. Um, this is the end of our webinar today. And again, thank you, Andrea, for joining us. Um, and we appreciate your time and energy for joining us. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye, everyone.